people who wouldn't have heard about trade unions apart from from coming to a festival. So it's working in the sense that there are people from the trade union movement who understand the festival, if you like, scene, but there are lots of people from the festival scene who are thinking, who is this Battersea and Wandsworth people? What do they do? Finding out more and then joining unions when they go back, go back to work. I think it's very crucial that the younger people uh, get on board and uh, take up the, the baton from um, for the older generation of the Workers' Beer Company. Um, we have a lot of people up north in the, you know, um, Clown and various different places who are very actively involved. But really, my main concern is to get these people unionised because that is their main crux of what we're all about. And I think uh, if these young people take up the political banner from us, I said we have a great future. Well, the trade union movement, I think, has uh, changed shape over the last uh, 30, 40 years. And it's changed shape that uh, a lot of socialising is done, in the sense of the word, socialising around events, whether it be May Day, uh, whether it be the uh, march that we had uh, against the privatisation of the railways uh, about Cuba. And uh, our union has uh, a regular event each year, and we have a number of major events around the country. And we like to use the Workers' Beer Company because, number one, uh, it's a workers' beer company uh, for workers, workers' beer. The people that work for them are dedicated trade unionists who run it on behalf of the trade union movement. And we see it as, you know, not just a backup to the trade union movement, uh, but uh, certainly linked and uh, deep rooted into the trade union movement and delivering this kind of service. Otherwise, uh, we'd be going to the uh, private off licenses of the world. And that's the reason why we want to give it to the trade union movement. So, by trade unions uh, being involved in the uh, workers' beer company, uh, and get them to do gigs and certain events. What it's doing is giving the trade union movement some backbone as well. I think it was needed really because at that period in time there was a vacuum. There was a vacuum in terms of politics and, and really community and grassroots politics as well, whereby um, the GLC had been, had been got rid of by the government and uh, people had been involved with projects and these projects were still around and people have got used to kind of being able to resource campaigns and various issues and in a sense really the idea of being able to fundraise became paramount and we realized through running the bars and people working on the bars we could ask organizations to come along work on the bars and they could fundraise and effectively it was in response to that really and that was the driving force right from the off before we kind of ever understood business or the commerce or the principles really it was a fundraising exercise and uh, it was also a way of, in a sense, being able to provide bars for our own festivals and being able to provide bars for benefits and things like that. And we quickly, in the first few years, got asked to, be, to provide bars at all sorts of kind of, you know, campaigning organisations and festivals and things like that. And that's where we really took off. Well, I think culture and music and art and banners and posters are very much a part of the Labour tradition. Mind you, they're part, if you like, of all tradition. If you take the monarchy, they get the Brigade of Guards out and there's the Queen and there's the Union Jack and so on. But why should those cultural assets be only available to the other side? So Labour movement have wonderful tradition of banners, of posters, of music, of hymns, of stories, and the Workers' Beer Company has funded them. Mind you, I'm a lifelong teetotaler, so I've never had a drop of beer in my life. I'm keeping it for my old age, and I'm only 81. So it's a funny person to be talking about the workers' beer company as a teetotaler. But still, I've seen the benefit. And, uh, you know, the booze can destroy lives, but in the case of the workers' beer company, it keeps l life and hope alive. And what more can you ask? I was aware of before it was founded, and of course it was founded out of... Uh, high unemployment in those days, giving workers um, a hope of some jobs uh, and that they've done and they've succeeded and uh, they're involved in Glastonbury, uh, they help out the trade unions, uh, they fund uh, different uh, issues for us. Uh, today we're involved in uh, Hope Not Hate Racism, uh, the anti-racist campaign. Uh, Races them out of football they were involved with. Well, I, I think I think there's always been a tradition of 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 of, of, of people kind of you know work, working fairly closely within the borough. Once was had a long history, and uh, I think I think um, looking back on it, I think that in some senses it followed that all that energy was going to go into something because you had a lot of very talented people around and who'd been around at kind of 
be it working for the GLC or be it involved in local government, things like that. Now that energy could quite easily have been dissipated and people could have gone off and done their own thing and so on and so forth. But that's not what happened. There was a coming together of, of minds in terms of how, where do we go from here and what are we going to do with ourselves. And uh, in a sense, um, you know, we found ourselves involved with this activity. You know, we didn't kind of go away and dream it up and sort of say this is what we're going to do. We kind of find ourselves involved with this activity. And it was kind of Michael Evis very much saying he would like us to do his bars at Glastonbury. And in a sense, our project for the next 20 years was, was set, basically. Didn't someone didn't, get married at Glastonbury yes, in the field? Yes, yes and, and one, field. one of them uh, culminated in the marriage uh, around the Stone Circle at Glastonbury. Not actually when the festival was happening, but uh, but just a little bit earlier in the year, and Michael Evis was the guest of honour. Really? Jan and Aidan Grimes. Well, without the volunteers, we wouldn't be anywhere. We had no volunteers, we wouldn't have any workers' beer company. So, and they are the heart of the uh, Trades Council and the workers' beer company. I think the fun angle was important because people were so put, put upon, you know, and people needed an outlet. And you know the outlet came through festivals. The outlet came through through the beer company doing things where people thought, oh, actually, I can have fun here, but I'm actually learning something and thinking there is a left. You know, it's not all about being downtrodden. You know, the left movement carries on, and the left movement will carry on, but we can do that in a fun way as well. Yes, I think there's no doubt about it. So, I mean, if you combine uh, a trade union event with some kind of social event. It's not just about listening to uh, the main key speakers, uh, it's about listening to your brothers and sisters by the side of you and picking up experiences. And that can be uh, over a pint uh, and it can be listening to someone, but uh, I personally believe uh, that uh, people pick up information uh, through chatting on a social basis and how better to chat with a glass of beer in your hand and how better that the workers' beer companies providing that beer. Well, I've always been, I mean, I always say to Steve, Steve was and they're always trying to get me to uh, join the union. I said, look, you know, I'm the best shop steward you can find. I don't need the union. But, you know, as we went PLC, we got bigger, and uh, I decided to invite the union into the Mean Fiddler. Uh, and I think that was the only time, that was the only time ever in history that uh, the chairman of the PLC invited the union to come into the company. <laughs> I, think they, I think that was mentioned by the Walker's Beer Company at the Southern Labour Conference. Uh, it's just a unique situation. Well, what we try to do, if we're, we've got a youth uh, section now, or it's called a young members section, we're not allowed to call it a youth section, a young members section in our union. And what we done was, was that the youth award winner and our young members, we give them uh, tickets to go down to Glastonbury. And what we try to do is put the trade union movement on the scene uh, for especially the youngsters that went to Glastonbury. I mean, Glastonbury is for people for all ages. Uh, but it was trying to get a message over to young people what the trade union movement was about because there's a generation gap there where before your father and mother was in a union and their father and mother was in a union now you've got swathes of industry where it's been wiped out that they're not in unions so when they go home a lot of people don't know what a trade union is and we've got to try and link in with these people whether it be at Glastonbury or whether it be in a community or in a pub uh, that trade union is a necessity uh, in today's modern age. Well. Um I don't, I don't think it created really any problems, but the, 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 there is a different reality in terms of, 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 of what it means to go and do events at festivals. And it, it mainly, that mainly is at, at, at the stage where ourselves, who are full-time staff that work for the organisation, have got to go and negotiate. Sponsorship now is a very, very important factor. And it's very real. We're dealing with national drink brands like Diageo and uh, Coors and Budweiser and people like that. These are big, big companies. They're very, very clear themselves what they're about and where they're going. The, their employees are very sharp. They know exactly what it is they need to get out of things. And in a sense, really, we've got to be able to match and work with these people so that they feel that that we're very much working with them, but also that, yes, their involvement with such and such a festival is a good move, and that the people who are there on the ground serving their beer, it's their brand or whatever, that we're representing it and things like that. And there, there are contradictions in that in time, because obviously, obviously, it, it's a very different dynamic. It's a very different dynamic in terms of what we're about and what somebody's about who's trying to promote a brand 
and uh, we, we've, we, we, we've had to learn to kind of take that on board. And, um, but we, we've come through that now, and we, we, we basically see the importance of sponsorship very clearly as being the future of festivals. Festivals can't really happen without key sponsorship money. And again, we want festivals to happen, and we ourselves as a company um, know a lot about sponsorship now, and we very much warmly welcome you know, working with the promoters, working with the sponsorship companies, and as a company we put investment into that, whereby we've got personnel and people who have knowledge and information and make it their business to find out what's happening really, to keep abreast and be able to make that experience positive for everybody. There are, certainly, there, there is competition. Um, they don't offer a di different style of service. Uh, our strength is that we can deliver draft beer on a personal basis. So, for example, someone comes up to the bar with their own money. They don't have to buy a token anywhere. They can go with their own money and buy a pint of cold beer at a reasonable price. It's similar to what they would buy in their local pub. Yeah, we certainly can try and marry it up because, in a sense, really, um, you know, one, one of the one of the one of the wonderful ways that we've married it up is is, for example, by getting companies like Budweiser. To, to, to use ethical T-shirts, and we own a brand which is called Ethical 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 T-shirt. We own a brand called Ethical Threads, and uh, in order to source an ethical product and to make sure that it's ethically produced right through uh, from from seed to garment, uh, you can you need to use different countries. So, for example, the cotton we're probably going to get next year will have been grown in Uganda and taken to Ethiopia to be made under unionised conditions and then brought to the UK. You know, we've been able to sort of say to them this is important and if you want our servers to wear your t-shirts and feel proud, let's have an ethical t-shirt and in fairness to them they've taken that on board and they've seen the value in that and uh, so there are a meeting in minds in, in, in lots of ways that mightn't be immediately evident to the outsider, really. And that really is, is again, it's progress and things like that, you know. But ultimately, as you rightly say, business is very focused. Most business is about making a profit, increasing shareholder value. Our business is not the same. Our business is about fundraising, and it's about developing that relationship whereby everybody can benefit and uh, hopefully get something out of, out, out of the occasion. The success of the company has been based almost entirely on the key relationships between Steve Pryle, Michael Levis, and Vince Power. And along with Steve, the Battersea and Wonsert Trade Union Congress, which has supplied all of the staff and all the workers to go with that. There was always big doubts as to whether Glastonbury would happen or not because uh, you know, now I sold out to a huge corporation. But I've always said, and it's maintained true, they've done a deal. I've always maintained that the festival last May will happen. Because there's such a huge need for it from, from the punter's point of view. It'll, I think it'll always happen. I believe, um, you know, that I'll never stop laughing about the scenes that I've seen, the funny things that I've seen, about the challenges that have gone on, and, the, you know, the times that I've been amazed by what people have achieved. So I've got, I've got fantastic memories and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, another, another 150 years would be far too soon. They've put their money where their mouth was and, that, that, and it's just grown and grown and grown because people have believed in them and the trade union movement has believed in them because that's where they were really founded from, their belief in trade unionism and socialism. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted for them. Brilliant. And another 20 years. <laughs> Yeah, we have a workers' beer company in Germany. We have one, uh, a company in Germany now, goes to Germany, and also a workers' beer company in Ireland. We're working on the, uh, the prospect of perhaps uh, having uh, workers' beer company in Spain. So we're going, uh, developing quite, quite fast. We've already started working with them, really. You know, myself and the workers' beer company. We've now, uh, they're, you know, they're partly going to be involved in Spain in the festival. It's a new. They, they, they will set up the infrastructure over there, which does, you know. I think the great thing about a company like the Workers' Beer Company is that you can do the same in any country, really. 
that we can do now in Europe, but you can do it in any country where you do it with those like-minded people who want to work for a campaign or cause and who want to give a bit back and, uh, and also have fun out of it. I mean, it's a great way of uh, you know, working and giving back and raising money. I mean, um, everybody, every, it's, it seems to be a, everybody gains or, from it, you know. The greatest achievement of the Workers' Beer Company in general. Well, I think uh, the fact that we have uh, our own pub, we have our own base, and the main, uh, the amount of uh, employment that we created within the company is, uh, is a big achievement. I always think the great thing is that, you know, the, the, the beer company and the trades council, you see, they were ethical when it wasn't trendy to be ethical. I mean, they were smart when it wasn't particularly trendy to be smart, and they were brave when lots of people in the organised movement were saying, get your head down. So, you know, for me, they've earned their place, they've led. And a lot of unique individuals who got, by the way, nothing out of it, out of it other than their own satisfaction that they were helping people, they think that's pretty good. One of the key parts, one of the key reasons why it's been so, so successful is that a whole group of talented people came together and pooled their talents, their skills, their knowledge into what was essentially a voluntary part-time activity for them. But did it with such enthusiasm that you don't normally give to your employer. Shouldn't say that really. But uh, people were prepared to really put themselves out, work 24 hours, work in appalling conditions that they would not work uh, for pay. They would not work. If someone said, I will pay you to get up to your waist and crap, and rescue the beer supply. You would say, no, I won't do that. But if Steve Pryor asks you, you'll do it. We've achieved political democracy, now we should achieve industrial democracy. And the Workers' Beer Company, operating on entirely non-capitalist basis, has shown that commitment is worth a lot. And you won't hear when you hear the business news and they tell you what's happened to the FTSE and the Dow Jones, you won't hear about the profits of the Workers' Beer Company. And if you did, and they were to measure the success of the Workers' Beer Company by the profits, I must say I would have doubts. But knowing the Battersea uh, Trades Council, I know it will never happen. And knowing the miners, I know it will never happen. Small local organisation, you know, small profits, and um, here we are now. I never envisaged in a million years where we'd be, we have what we have now. You know, all the major festivals, Glastonbury, Reading, and so on and so forth. I never envisaged that in a million years. And I'm uh, very, very proud of the company. And Glastonbury I've done three or four times now. Tollpuddle, well, probably only for about five or six years. But uh, I'm inspired by them all. It gives me hope. And that's what makes it such fun. And the arts are a very important part of that. Enjoying yourself. After all, politics isn't uh, grim, you know. It's about people's lives. And when, when Tony Benn first came to Glastonbury, it was the first festival he'd ever been to before. And I don't think Tony Benn's missed one since. And, and uh, Tony Benn is, is not known for, is, you know, T Tony Benn is a sharp cookie. And uh, you've got to think to yourself, he sees the potential there for, in a sense, talking to people, people to talk to him, to challenge perceptions, and to encourage people to hold on to the things they value and to kind of, you know, not to, you know, to, to, you know, to keep on in terms of, 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 of striving towards a fairer society, basically. Well, I carry a thermos. I mean, I've been in the labour movement so long, you can't rely on being fed. I always carry a sandwich, a thermos, a banana, a Mars bar, and that keeps me going, because much as I love the labour movement, they're more interested in your speech than your belly, and you sometimes, when you get off the platform, they say, well, thanks very much, Tony, you've got to find your own way back to the station and uh, be sure you don't starve on the way. But I'm not complaining because I don't go to these do's for grub. I go because I want to contribute, and indeed I'm inspired by them myself. And of course, there's a very fine print here. <laughs> I bring to your attention the original. <laughs>